data and pre-train the critic, we now need to get it to kind of ping-pong between training a little bit of each. And um, the amount of time you spend on each of those things and the learning rates you use is still a little bit on the fussy side. So we've created a, um, um, a GAN learner for you, which you just pass in your generator and your critic, which we've just, just simply loaded here from the ones we just trained. Um, and it will go ahead and when you go learn.fit, it will do that for you. It will figure out how much time to train the generator and then when to switch to training the discriminator, the critic, and it'll go back on and forward. Um, these weights here is that um, what we actually do is we don't only use the critic as the loss function. If we only use the critic as the loss function, um, the GAN could get very good at creating pictures that um, look like real pictures but they actually have nothing to do with the original picture, uh, the original photo at all. So we actually add together the pixel loss and the critic loss. And so um, those two losses are kind of on different scales. So we multiply the pixel loss by something between about 50 and about 200. Again, something in that range generally works pretty well. Um, something else with GANs, um, GANs hate momentum when you're training them. It kind of doesn't make sense to train them with momentum because you keep switching between generator and critic, so it's kind of tough. Maybe there are ways to use momentum, but I'm not sure anybody's figured it out. So um, this number here, when you create an atom optimizer, is where the momentum goes, so you should set that to zero. So anyway, if you're doing GANs, use these hyperparameters. Um, it should work. Um, okay, so um, so that's what GAN Learner does, and so then you can go fit, and it trains for a while. And one of the tough things about GANs is that these loss numbers, um, they're meaningless. You can't expect them to go down, right? Because as the generator gets better, it gets harder for the discriminator, the, cr the critic. And then as the critic gets better, it gets harder for the generator. So the numbers should stay about the same. Right? Um, so that's one of the tough things about training GANs is it's kind of hard to know how are they doing. So the only way to know how are they doing is to actually take a look at the results from time to time. I haven't, um, and so if you put um, show image equals true here, it'll actually print out a sample after every epoch. I haven't put that in the notebook because it makes it too big for, for the repo, but you can try that. Um, so I've just put the results at the bottom, and here it is. So, pretty beautiful, I would say. Um, uh, we already knew how to get rid of the, the numbers, but we re now don't really have that kind of artifact of where it used to be, and it's, it's definitely sharpening up this little kitty cat quite nicely. Um, it's not great, always. Like, there's some weird kind of noise going on here. Um, uh, certainly a lot better than the horrible original. Like, this is a tough job to turn that into that. Um, but there are some really obvious problems. Like here, these things ought to be eyeballs, and they're not. So why aren't they? Well, our critic doesn't know anything about eyeballs. And even if it did, it wouldn't know that eyeballs are particularly important. You know, we care about eyes. Like, when we see a cat without eyes, a lot less cute. Um, I mean, I'm more of a dog person, but you know, um, it, it's, um, it just doesn't know that this is a feature that, that matters. Um, particularly because the critic, remember, is not a pre-trained network. So I kind of suspect that if we replace the critic with a pre-trained network that's been pre-trained on ImageNet but is also compatible with GANs, it might do a better job here. Um, but it, it's definitely a shortcoming of this approach. So we're going to have a break. Um, oh, question first, uh, and then we'll have a break, and then after the break I will show you how to find the cat's eyeballs again. For what kind of problems do you not want to use UNETs? <clears throat> well, UNETs are for when the... Um, 
the size of your output you know, is, is uh, similar to the size of your input and kind of aligned with it. There's no point kind of having cross connections if that level of spatial resolution in the output isn't necessary or useful. So um, yeah, any kind of generative modeling and you know, segmentation is kind of generative modeling, right? It's, it's generating a picture which is a mask of the original objects. Um, yeah, so probably anything where you want that kind of, that kind of resolution of the output to be of the same kind of fidelity as the resolution of the input. Um, obviously, something like a classifier makes no sense, right? You, you, in a classifier, you just want the downsampling path because at the end, you just want a single number, which is like, is it a dog or a cat, or what kind of pet is it, or whatever. Um, great. Okay, so let's um, get back together at five past eight. Just before we leave GANs, I'll just mention there's another um, notebook you might be interested in looking at, um, which is uh, Lesson 7W GAN. Um, when GANs started a few years ago, people generally used them to kind of create images out of thin air, which I personally don't think is a particularly useful or interesting thing to do. Um, but it's kind of a good, I don't know, it's a good research exercise, I guess. So um, we implemented this, uh, this WGAN paper, which was kind of really the first one to do a somewhat adequate job somewhat easily. Um, and so you can see how to do that with the fast AI library. Um, it, it's kind of interesting because um, the, the data set we use is this uh, L Sun Bedrooms data set, which we've provided in our URLs, um, which just, as you can see, has bedrooms. Lots and lots and lots of bedrooms. Um, and the approach, you'll see in the pros here that Sylvain wrote, the, the, the approach that we use in this case is to just say, can we create a bedroom? And so what we actually do is that the, um, the input to the generator isn't an image that we clean up. We actually feed to the generator random noise. And so then the generator's task is, can you turn random noise into something which the critic can't tell the difference between that output and a real bedroom? Um, and so we're not doing any pre-training here or any of the stuff that makes this kind of fast and easy. Um, um, uh, so this is a very traditional approach, but you can still see, you still just go, you know, GAN learner, and there's actually a WGAN version, which is, you know, this kind of older style approach. Um, but you just pass in the data and the generator and the critic in the usual way, um, and you call fit. And you'll see, um, in this case, we have a show image on. You know, after Epoch 1, it's not creating great bedrooms or two or three. And you can really see that in the early days of these kinds of GANs, it doesn't do a great job of anything. Um, but eventually, uh, after, you know, a couple of hours of training, um, producing somewhat like bedroom-ish things, you know. So anyway, it's a notebook you can have a play with and um, um, it's a bit of fun. So um, I was very excited when we got Fast AI to the point in the last week or so um, that we had GANs working in a way where kind of API-wise they're far more concise and more flexible than any other library that exists. Um, but also kind of disappointed with them. Um, they take a long time to train and the outputs are still like so-so. And so the next step was like, well, can we get rid of GANs entirely? So the first step with, with that, I mean, obviously the thing we really want to do is come up with a better loss function. We want a loss function that does a good job of saying this is a high quality image um, without having to go all the all the GAN trouble, and preferably it also doesn't just say it's a high quality image, but it's an image which actually looks like the thing it's meant to. So the real trick here um, comes back to this uh, paper from a couple of years ago, uh, Perceptual Losses for Real-Time Style Transfer and Super Resolution. <coughs> Justin Johnson uh, et al. Um, created this thing they call Perceptual Losses. It's a nice paper, but I, I, I hate this term um, because there's nothing particularly perceptual about them. I would call them feature losses. So in the fast AI library, you'll see this referred to as feature losses. Um, and it shares something with GANs, which is that um, 
um, after we go through our generator, which they call the image transform net, and you can see it's got this kind of U-net shaped thing. They didn't actually use U-nets because at the time this came out, nobody in the machine learning world much knew about U-nets. Um, nowadays, of course, we use U-nets. Um, but anyway, something U-net-ish. Um, uh, I should mention, like, uh, in these kind of these architectures where you have a downsampling path followed by an upsampling path, the downsampling path is very often called the encoder. Um, as you saw in our code, actually, we called that the encoder. And the upsampling path is very often called the decoder. Um, <clears throat> in generative models, you know, uh, generally, including generative text models, neural translation, stuff like that, they tend to be called the encoder and the decoder, two pieces. Anyway, so we have this, um, this, this generator, and we want a, a loss function that says, you know, uh, is the thing that it's created uh, like the thing that we want? And so the way they do that is they take the prediction. Remember, y hat is what we normally use for a prediction from a model. We take the prediction and we put it through a pre-trained image net network. So at the time that this came out, the pre-trained image network they were using was VGG. Um, people still, t it's kind of old now, but people still tend to use it because it works fine for this process. Um, so they take the prediction and they put it through VGG, the pre-trained image net network. It doesn't matter too much which one it is. Um, and so normally the output of that would tell you, hey, is this generated thing, you know, a dog or a cat or an airplane or a, or a fire engine or whatever, right? Um, but in the process of getting to that final um, classification, it goes through lots of different layers. And in this case, they've color-coded all the layers with the same um, grid size in the feature map with the same color. So every time we switch colors, we're switching grid size. So there's a stride to conv, or in VGG's case, they still used to use um, max pooling layers, which kind of similar idea. Um, and so what we could do is say, hey, let's, let's not take the final output of the VGG model on this generated image, but let's take kind of something in the middle. <coughs> let's take the activations of some layer in the middle. So those activations, you know, it might be a feature map of like 256 channels by 28 by 28. Say. And so those kind of 28 by 28 grid cells will kind of roughly semantically say things like, hey, in this, in this part of that 28 by 28 grid, is there something that looks kind of furry? Or is there something that looks kind of shiny? Or is there something that looks kind of circular? Or is there something that kind of looks like an eyeball? Or whatever. So what we do is that we then take the, the target, so the, the actual Y value, and we put it through the same pre-trained VGG network, and we can pull out the activations at the same layer, and then we do a mean squared error comparison. So it'll say like, okay, in the real image, grid cell 1, 1 of that 28 by 28 feature map, you know, uh, is, is furry and blue and round shaped, and in the generated image, it's furry and blue and not round shaped. So it's kind of like an okay match. So that ought to go a long way towards fixing our eyeball problem, because in this case, the feature map's going to say, there's eyeballs here, sorry, here, but there isn't here. So do a better job of that, please. Make better eyeballs. So that's the idea. Okay? And so that's what we call feature losses, or uh, Johnson et al. called perceptual losses. So... So to do that, um, we're going to use the um, Lesson 7 Super Res notebook. Um, and uh, this time, the task uh, we're going to do is kind of the same as the um, previous task, but I wrote this notebook a little bit before the GAN notebook, um, before I came up with the idea of like putting text on it and having a random JPEG quality. So the JPEG quality is always 60. There's no text written on top, um, and it's 96 by 96. So, uh, and it's before I realized what a great word crapify is, so it's called resize. Um, so here's our crappy images and our original images. Um, kind of a similar task to what we had before. So um, I'm gonna try and create a loss function which does this. So the first thing I do is I define a base loss function 
um, which is basically like, how am I going to compare the pixels and the features? Um, you know, and the choices mainly are like MSC or L1. Doesn't matter too much which you choose. Um, I tend to like L1 better than MSC, actually, so I picked L1. Right? So anytime you see base loss, we mean L1 loss. Uh, you could use MSC loss as well. So let's create a VGG model, right? So just using the pre-trained model. Um, in VGG, there's an attribute called dot features, which contains the uh, convolutional part of the model. So here's the uh, convolutional part of the VGG model, because we don't need the head, because we only want the, the intermediate activations. So then we'll chuck that on the GPU. We'll put it into eval mode, because we're not training it. And we'll turn off requires grad, because we don't want to update the weights of this model. We're just using it for inference, right, for, for the loss. So then let's enumerate through all the children of that model and find all of the max pooling layers, because in, in the VGG model, that's where the um, grid size changes. And as you can see from this picture, we kind of want to grab features from every time just before the grid size changes. So we grab layer I minus one. So that's the layer before it changes. So there's our list of layer numbers just before the max pooling layers. Um, and so all of those are values, not surprisingly. Um, so those are where we want to grab some features from. Uh, and so we put that in blocks. It's just a list of IDs. So here's our feature loss class, which is going to implement this idea. So basically, we, uh, when we call the feature loss class, we're going to pass it some pre-trained model. And so that's going to be called M feet. That's the model which contains the features which we want to generate for, we want our feature loss on. So we can go ahead and grab all of the layers from that network that we want the losses for, that we want, sorry, that we want the uh, features for to create the losses. Um, so we're going to need to hook all of those outputs because remember that's how we grab intermediate layers in PyTorch is by hooking them. So this is going to contain our um, our hooked outputs. Uh, so now in the forward of feature loss, um, we're going to call make features passing in the target. So this is our actual Y, which is just going to call that VGG model and go through all of the stored activations and just um, grab a copy of them. And so we're going to do that both for the target, call that out feet, and for the input. So that's the um, output of a generator in feet. Uh, and so now um, let's um, calculate the L1 loss between the pixels, because we still want the pixel loss a little bit. And then let's also go through all of those <coughs> layers features <coughs> and get the L1 loss on them. Right? So we're basically going through every one of these uh, end of each block and grabbing the activations and getting the L1 on each one. So that's going to end up um, in this list called feature losses, which I then sum them all up. Okay? And you know, by the way, the reason I do it as a list is because we've got this nice little callback that um, if you put them into a thing called dot metrics in your loss function, it'll print out all of the separate layer um, loss amounts for you, which is super handy. Um, so that's it. That's our perceptual loss or feature loss um, class. And so now we can just go ahead and train a unit in the usual way with our data and our pre-trained architecture, which is a ResNet 34, passing in our loss function, which is using our pre-trained VGG model. And this is that callback I mentioned, loss metrics, which is going to print out all the different layers losses for us. Um, these are two things that we'll learn about in part two of the course, but you should use them. Uh, LR find. Uh, I just created a little function called do fit that does fit one cycle and then saves the model and then shows the results. So um, as per usual, because we're using a pre-trained network in our unit, we start with frozen layers um, for the downsampling path, train for a while, and as you can see, we get not only the loss, but also the pixel loss and the loss at each of our feature layers. And then also something we'll learn about in part two called gram loss. Um, which um, I don't think anybody's used for SuperRes before as far as I know, but um, as you'll see, it turns out great. 
So that's uh, eight minutes, so much faster than a GAN, and already, as you can see, this is our output, modeled output, pretty good. So then we unfreeze and train some more, and it's a little bit better. And then let's switch up to double the size, and so we need to also halve the batch size to avoid running out of GPU memory, and freeze again, and train some more, so it's now taking half an hour, even better. And then unfreeze and train some more. So all in all, we've done about an hour and 20 minutes of training. And look at that. It's, it's, it's done it. Like, I mean, those, it's, it knows that eyes are important. So it's really made an effort. It knows that fur is important. So it's really made an effort. So it started with something with like JPEG artifacts around the ears and um, all this mess and like eyes that are just kind of vague light blue things and it just, it really created a lot of texture. This cat is clearly kind of like looking over the top of one of those little clawing frames covered in fuzz. So it actually recognized that this thing is probably kind of a carpety material. So it's created a carpety material for us. So, I mean, that's just remarkable. So, um, talking of remarkable, we can now, um, so I, I've, n I've never seen outputs like this before without a GAN. Uh, so I was just so excited when we were able to generate this, and so quickly, one GPU, hour and a half. Um, so like, if you create your own crapification functions and train this model, you'll build stuff that nobody's built before. Because like nobody else is, that I know of is doing it this way. So there are huge opportunities, I think. Um, so check this out. What we can now do is we can now, um, instead of starting with our low res, I actually stored another set at size 256, which are called medium res. So let's see what happens if we upsize a medium res. So we're gonna grab our medium res data, and um, <coughs> here, is, um, here is our medium res stored photo. And so can we improve this? So you can see there's still a lot of room for improvement. Like you see the, uh, the, the um, lashes here are very pixelated. Place where there should be hair here is just kind of fuzzy. So watch this area as I hit down on my keyboard. Bump. Look at that. It's done it. You know, it's taken a medium res image and it's made a totally clear thing here. You know, the furs reappeared. Like, look at the eyeball. Let's go back. The eyeball here is just kind of a general blue thing. Here, it's added all the right texture, you know. So, I, I just think this is super exciting, you know. Here's a model I trained in an hour and a half um, using standard stuff that you've all learnt about, a unit, a pre-trained model, um, a feature loss function, and we've got something which can turn that into that, uh, or, you know, this absolute mess into this. And like it's really exciting to think what, what could you do with that, right? So one of the inspirations here um, has been um, a guy called um, Jason Antich. And um, Jason um, uh, was a student in the course last year. Um, and um, what he did, very sensibly, was um, decide to focus uh, basically nearly quit his job and work four days a week, or really six days a week, on studying deep learning. And uh, as you should do, he created a kind of capstone project. And his project was to combine GANs and feature losses together. And his crapification approach was um, to take um, color pictures and make them black and white. So he took the whole of ImageNet, created a black and white ImageNet, and then trained a model to recolorize it. And he's put this up as deoldify. And now he's got these actual old photos from the 19th century that he's turning into color. And like, what this is doing is incredible. Like, like, look at this. The model thought, oh, that's probably some kind of copper kettle. So I'll make it like copper colored. And oh, these pictures are on the wall. They're probably like different colors to the wall. And maybe that looks a bit like a mirror. Maybe it would be reflecting stuff outside, you know. Uh, these things might be vegetables. Vegetables are often red, you know, let's make them red. Uh, it, it's, it's extraordinary what it's done. 
And you could totally do this too. Like you can take our feature loss and our GAN loss and combine them. So I'm very grateful to Jason because he's helped us um, build this, um, this lesson. And it's been really nice because we've been able to help him too because um, he hadn't realized that he can use all this pre-training and stuff. And so hopefully you'll see Deoldify in the next couple of weeks be even better at deoldification. Um, but hopefully you all can now add um, other kinds of decrapification um, methods um, as well. So I'm, you know, I, I, I like every course if possible to, to, to show something totally new because then every student has the chance to basically build things that have never been built before. So this is, this is kind of that thing, you know, but between the much better segmentation results and these much simpler and faster uh, decrapification results, I think you can build some really cool stuff. Did you have a question? Is it possible to use similar ideas to UNET and GANs for NLP? For example, if I want to tag the verbs and nouns in a sentence or create a really good Shakespeare generator? Yeah, um, pr pretty much. We don't fully know yet. It's a pretty new area, but uh, there's a lot of opportunities there. And we'll be looking at some in, in a moment, actually. Um, So I actually um, tried training this, uh, well, I actually tried testing this on this. Um, remember this picture I showed you of a slide uh, last lesson? And it, it's a really rubbishy looking picture. And I thought, what would happen if we tried running this just through the exact same model? And it changed it from that to that. Um, so I thought that was a really good example. You can see something it didn't do, which is this weird discoloration. It didn't fix it because I didn't crapify things with weird discoloration, right? So if you want to create really good image restoration, like I say, you need really good um, um, crapification. Okay, so um, here's what we've learned so far, right, um, in, in the course, um, some of the main things. So we've learned that um, um, neural nets consist of sandwich layers of affine functions which are basically matrix multiplications, slightly more general version, and nonlinearities, like ReLU. And we learned that the results of those calculations are called activations, and the things that go into those calculations that we learn are called parameters, and that the parameters are initially randomly initialized, or we copy them over from a pre-trained model, and then we train them with SGD or faster versions, and we learned that um, convolutions are a particular affine function that work great for um, Autocorrelated data, so things like images and stuff. We learned about batch norm, dropout, data augmentation, and weight decay as ways of uh, regularizing models, and also batch norm helps train models more quickly. And then today we've learned about uh, res slash dense blocks. Um, we've obviously learned a lot about image classification and regression, embeddings, categorical and continuous variables, collaborative filtering, language models and NLP classification, and then kind of segmentation unit and GANs. So um, go over these things and make sure that you feel comfortable with each of them. If you've only watched this uh, series once, you definitely won't. People normally watch it, you know, three times or so to really understand the detail. Um, so uh, one thing that doesn't, uh, that doesn't get here is um, RNNs. So that's the last thing we're going to do, RNNs. Okay. So, um, RNNs, I'm going to introduce a little kind of diagrammatic method here to explain RNNs. Um, and the diagrammatic method, I'll start by showing you a basic neural net with a single hidden layer. Um, square means an input. So that'll be batch size by number of inputs, right? So kind of, you know, um, batch size by number of inputs. Um, an arrow means a layer, broadly defined such as matrix product followed by ReLU. A circle is um, uh, activations, okay? So in this case, we have one set of hidden activations, and so given that the input was number of inputs, this here is a, a matrix of number of inputs by number of activations, so the output will be batch size by number of activations. It's really important you know how to calculate these shapes, right? So go learn dot summary lots to see all the shapes. <clears throat> so then here's another arrow. So that means it's another layer. 
matrix product followed by nonlinearity. In this case, we're going to the output, so we use softmax. And then triangle means an output. Okay, and so this matrix product will be number of activations by number of classes, so our output is batch size by number of classes. Okay, so let's reuse the, that key. Remember, triangle output, circle is activations, um, hidden state, we also call that, um, and rectangle is input. So let's now imagine that we wanted to um, uh, create, a, get a big document, split it into um, uh, sets of three words at a time, and grab each set of three words and then try to predict um, uh, the third word using the first two words. So uh, if we had the data set in place, we could grab word one as an input, chuck it through an embedding, right, create some activations, um, pass that through a um, uh, matrix product and, um, and nonlinearity, um, grab the second word, put it through an embedding, and then we could either add those two things together or concatenate them. Generally speaking, when you see kind of two sets of activations coming together um, in a diagram, you normally have a choice of concatenate or, or add. Um, and that's going to create a second bunch of activations, and then you could put it through one more um, uh, fully connected layer and softmax to create an output. So that would be a totally standard fully connected neural net with one very minor tweak, which is concatenating or adding at this point, um, which we could use to try to predict the third word of every, uh, from pairs of two words. Okay, um, so remember arrows represent layer operations, um, and uh, I removed in this one the specifics of what they are because they're always an affine function followed by a nonlinearity. Um, okay. Let's go further. What if we wanted to predict word four using words one and two and three? It's basically the same picture as last time, except with one extra input and one extra circle. But I want to point something out, which is each time we go from rectangle to circle, we're doing the same thing. We're doing an embedding, which is 